Hi, everyone. Good night and welcome to the third evening of our webinar series uh, sponsored by the Aurora Recovery Center. Uh, my name is Ian Rabb and I'm the Director of Business Development and, uh, and Public Relations Officer at Aurora, as well as an Addiction Specialist. And I qualify myself for being here and taking part in this uh, as I'm 16 and a half years uh, clean and sober from drugs and alcohol. And I've worked extensively in this field for the last probably 14 of them. Um, we're doing the webinar series for a number of reasons. Uh, First of all, to educate public for anybody that's listening in around uh, the use of drugs and alcohol and tonight mental health and addiction. And uh, we're also doing it for those that are tuning in that might have a problem with, uh, with drugs and alcohol and addiction and or mental health. So welcome to the third night of the webinar. Tonight we will be discussing, as I said, mental health and addiction. And with us we have uh, John. John is a registered, psychi registered psychiatric nurse with three years of experience in the addictions field, including counseling, nursing and an opiate replacement program and providing leadership as a team leader. His interests include suicide assessment, psychiatric assessment and motivational interviewing. He has provided educational sessions to psychiatric nurses, students and participates in creating licensing exams for future registered psychiatric nurses across Canada. Welcome John. Thank you very much. Thank Ian. you uh, for, for providing your expertise tonight on the topic. Absolutely. So we'll get right into the topic and I'll, uh, I'll let John start um, uh, talking about uh, mental health and addiction. Well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I guess a good place to start is uh, to ask why we might want to talk about mental health and addiction in particular. So many of us uh, might know someone who struggles with a mental health issue, or we ourselves might struggle with a mental health issue. And if we look at statistics from uh, the Mental Health Commission of Canada or the Canadian Mental Health Association, uh, what we will see is that there's actually as many as one in five people who will experience a mental health condition in their lifetime. Uh, when it comes to people who have an addiction, what we discover is that uh, those numbers uh, doubled. So uh, there's a 50% chance if you have an addiction that you will also have a mental health need. So we see that uh, it's very important to talk about mental health and addiction because quite often they go hand in hand. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken or the egg. You know, so many people talk about it. Um, you know, I often meet with parents and, have, and families and, and um, obviously it's a lot easier for a parent mm -hmm. to discuss my child with the mental health issues. He's depressed, he has anxiety, um, he's got social anxiety, but it's very hard for them to deem their child an addict or an alcoholic. And we know that often uh, alcoholism starts way before the mental health issue mm -hmm. and the, or the mental health issue starts and alcohol or drugs are used to cope with the mental health issue. Right. So how, how do we assess that or how do we look at what comes first, the mental health issue or the addiction? Well, I think it's a very good question and sometimes uh, it's difficult to, to tell what the answer is. I guess where we should start uh, is by saying that when somebody has both a mental health uh, issue and an addiction, we call it a co-occurring disorder or, or a dual diagnosis. Um, and there's actually several theories around um, why people might have, have um, both of those things at the same time. Uh, so for example, if you can imagine being somebody who is anxious and anxiety is something that many people struggle with, uh, we often look for a way of relieving that anxiety as quickly as possible. So if I'm someone with anxiety, I don't really want to go to a doctor to talk about it. I find out that alcohol might be a good way of fixing that anxiety, I'll drink. So in that situation, we might see that the mental health issue came first. Uh, in the case of, um, for example, someone who is drinking on a daily basis, um, day in, day out, when they don't drink, their, bro their body is craving that alcohol and they might start to feel anxious. So in that situation, we see that um, the addiction caused the mental health concern. And then, of course, um, there's a theory that says something like um, addiction and mental health affect the same parts of the brain. So rather than which one came first, um, they both sort of happen in tandem. 
So often I think about my own experience and I was diagnosed for years with many different mental health issues of which none were really true. Uh, maybe not none, but the majority of them weren't true. Um, I, I'm, of a, I'm the, of the belief that addiction started way before I started drugs and alcohol. Even my social anxiety really was a, was a significant symptom to my addiction. Right. So is there a way to figure out if the anxiety is real or if it's just the typical social anxiety that a, an alcoholic or addict feels? Or again, with depression, same kind of question. You know, I was depressed all the time because I couldn't stop using and drinking and I didn't know why. Right. So so there was a depression. For sure there was a depression mm -hmm. beyond the uh, chemistry in my brain being changed and altered because of the drugs and alcohol I was using, mm -hmm. which alcohol is a depressant too, if I believe. Correctly. Absolutely. So often I wonder, again, can we really, is there a way to figure out early on mm -hmm. if it's really something that's a mental health issue that needs to be treated mm -hmm. or is it really a social issue like alcoholism or addiction? For sure. Well, um, I, th I think, I think perhaps a really good place to start is to talk about what is a mental illness. Right. Perfect. And um, so we have some slides here. I'm not sure uh, if our audience can see them right now. OK, I think they can. So why don't we just um, scooch forward to the slide on what is a mental health issue? OK, right, just one, back back, one. perfect. So um, and it's on the on the screen there for everyone. When we talk about a mental illness and what is and isn't a mental illness, um, we have a lot of what we call lay appraisal. So um, lay people or people who maybe, you know, don't have a lot of education in mental illness saying, well, this guy's crazy, this guy's got bipolar or, you know, this girl is, um, there's something wrong. We need to kind of bring it back and, and look at a, a good definition. So um, a mental illness is characterized by a significant disturbance in thinking, emotions, or behavior. And really it's reflecting the fact that there's something going on with that person's thinking in their body or in the way they've developed. And the second piece to that puzzle is that it's associated with significant distress in social groups, work, and other important activities. Um, so I'm guessing based on your experience, we could tick those boxes. For, for sure. We could tick those boxes, right? right. Um, and let's talk about what an addiction is. Uh, and just for people's reference, at the end of the slides, you'll see that uh, these definitions have been taken from uh, a book called the DSM, which is kind of the, uh, the textbook of um, psychology, psychiatry. So an addiction then is a cluster of problems in thinking, behavior, and the body, showing that the individual continues using substances despite the problems that come up. Now, yesterday we actually discussed the 11 markers um, from the DSN okay. um, regarding alcoholism. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm familiar with the, uh, with the DSN for, for, for um, ultimately diagnosing mental health issues. Yeah. And I think our audience, if they're watching again tonight, um, would have been familiar with that too. I was looking at those uh, those 11 things and clearly I had 10 of them. So, so yeah, so really what we see then is um, it's a complicated question. Right, and they weren't all about drinking. The questions weren't, he puts his drink away. It was, there, there were lots of embedded mental health issues in, in those 11 statements. Exactly, so um, to get back to your question and for other people who might be listening, uh, watching and asking, you know, how do we tell? Um, well, it's pretty simple. We have to have the person be in a safe environment where they're able to stop using drugs or alcohol and be able to see how their behavior unfolds. So often, uh, and so often this happens, and we know that in the recovery business, in the treatment business, and we know it in life. I go to my doctor, mm -hmm. my GP, mm -hmm. and talk about my anxiety. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they do is give me a highly addictive drug mm -hmm. without really a, doing a full assessment around the DSN. Right. Or more so, the patient will not have told the doctor the truth. Right. You know, and it becomes a complicated issue because the patient is approaching the physician wanting a solution. And the solution, you know, in, in the, the physician in our society is expected to be able to give that solution. So um, there's an interaction that takes place, like you say, that's quick without investigation. And it usually doesn't end well. Without blame. 
I'd like to say that also. I think yeah. that most physicians, we know that 99% of physicians really mean well in their diagnosis and treatment. Of course. Um, I, th I think what's lacking, and uh, this is what we're going to move on to talk about in terms of treatment, is you know concrete options for people. So if I'm feeling anxious, all I know to do is to go to my physician and ask for medication. Perhaps what I don't know uh, to do is to look at learning things like meditation, look at learning things like mindfulness. Or why I'm anxious. Or why I'm anxious. Um, is so, there an event going on in my life? Has it been chronic? Is it just in social situations? Is it all the time? You have to ask, you have to investigate really and do a lot of investigation to um, really make that diagnosis. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so perhaps we shall move on and uh, we've already spoken about a co-occurring disorder. Why does this happen? So some theories as we touched on before, some people start to use as a way of coping. Um, so if you don't mind me asking uh, you, turn the tables here a little bit. Um, were you finding yourself using to sort of uh, dull or numb things that were happening for you? Ultimately, I look as I look back at it now, like 2020 is always hindsight. Yeah. You know, there was some childhood trauma, there was a lot of pain, and then there was a lot of insecurity. And, and you know, most alcoholics, uh, we, we tend to have this huge ego, no a self-esteem thing going on, mm -hmm. and it, which created a great emptiness and a great wholeness. Mm -hmm. And drugs and alcohol filled that wholeness for a long time for me. Yeah. And ultimately, it got rid of those feelings of social anxiety and not being good enough and fearing uh, interactions with friends or even going to the bar and, yeah. and interacting with people. So it worked for a while. And then as we know, if you're an addicted person, yeah. I wanted it to work more. Yeah. So I would take more and more. Yeah. And I'll, I'll share with you that ultimately I got to my drug of choice, mm -hmm. which was methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. And ultimately through that process, after using it, I was diagnosed with it, with ADD. Mm -hmm. I was not a kid that was a, was a terrible kid. I was, I'm high, I was highly successful. So ADD wasn't really a diagnosis they gave to highly successful people. Right. But ultimately methamphetamine, similar to the treatment for ADD, mm -hmm. um, calmed me down and slowed me down and got me really peaceful. Yeah. Although killed all my serotonin and dopamine inhibitors. So Absolutely. ultimately caused incredible depression and anxiety. And and so it's actually very common for people who uh, are drawn to using amphetamines, methamphetamines, to have an underlying ADHD disorder, right? So if we talk about the chicken and egg issue again, uh, sometimes people start to use as a way of coping with the, what's the, going on. There's many medications not to treat with ADHD. There's many medications that you cannot treat an addict with that have ADHD, isn't that correct? Well, absolutely, because again, we um, end up falling into this cycle of a person with addiction maybe not being able to regulate just taking one concerted pill in yeah. the morning or, or et cetera. Yeah. And so it does become a challenging situation. Or snorting them. Or snorting them. Or using them in other ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we move on here? Um, Let's talk about some different types of mental illness, if that works for people. And then maybe what we'll do is um, maybe we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, so perhaps some of the two main mental illnesses that people are familiar with uh, would be depression and anxiety. So when it comes to depression, um, you know, how do we know we have yeah. depression? It would be things like people having a lack uh, or an excess in their appetite. So you might have some people who find that they're not eating at all, um, or we might have some people who find that they're eating lots. Uh, being irritable and anxious, having a lack of pleasure in uh, everyday activities, feelings of hopelessness, suicidal thoughts, lack of sleep and excess sleep. Um, and of course, many of the things we're reading here might sound like you know, what it's like to be on a bend of drinking, right? Totally. Or, or using something else. So again, very hard to diagnose. Hard, hard to tell the difference. So in, when, you're, when we're dealing with addiction then, yeah. is it right that we have to eliminate the substance completely and for some time it, before we can actually diagnose the mental health it, issue? It's really the only way to know. The only way for us to cleanly be able to diagnose someone, have a, a physician, psychiatrist, psychologist diagnose someone is to see how they respond with a period of sobriety. 
Or abstinence. Or, or abstinence. Yeah. Um, it's the only way. And we do we know what time period that looks like, or is it different for everyone? It's different for everyone. Um, one of the uh, illnesses that we talk about here is uh, psychosis. I wonder if we could just skip forward to that. Psycho anxiety and psychotic disorders. So a really good example of um, when we can know uh, if something is based on use or if something is an underlying mental health issue, uh, psychosis is a good example. So for example, people who use methamphetamines, it can be really common for them to see and hear things that aren't there. Um, once they have stopped using and some time goes on, those voices or those things that they're seeing go away. So that tells us then that- It's it, amphetamine psychosis. It's amphetamine psychosis. If they were to stop and then the voices and, and the, the seeing things continued, that perhaps tells us that a psychosis independent of the amphetamines has developed. Interesting. I've, I've done a lot of research, obviously, on amphetamine psychosis. And um, the interesting thing I find about it is that everybody can have a different psychosis. You could be OCD, you could be schizophrenic, you could you could come in and exhibit many different psychiatric disorders yeah. coming off methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. And the worst part about it, if you've stayed clean off of it for a while and you do it again, the psychosis is apparently worse. Right. Is that correct? I, I would say there's good evidence for that and, and that we've seen it in practice, uh, is the more people are using, the more psychoses they're coming under, the worse it's going to be and the harder it is for them to stop yeah. in the long run, you know, and there's as many different um, manifestations of things that we see in here as there are for individuals, right? Because, because what's happening is our brain is kind of pumping out our own thoughts, feelings and experiences, and it's going to be different for everyone. So it just brings me to the thought of another question. So uh, in the treatment and when you're in a recovery center or in a treatment center or in a medical withdrawal unit, often, are there uh, medications we can use to treat intermittent depression? So if we, so someone's been clean and sober for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. in treatment, been detoxed, and we find them in a very depressive state, mm -hmm. is it often sometimes indicated maybe to give them a, a mild antidepressant to get them through that, or a man, mild anti-anxiety drug, or in the psychosis, even an antipsychotic? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start with the question about depression first. Uh, ideally, what people are going to uh, try is abstinence um, and then hopefully in conjunction with the abstinence, using some kind of cognitive behavioral therapy skills, learning to be appreciative of things, gratitude, meditation, and hopefully that's going to see a bit of a spike in, in their brain chemistry. Um, but if not, absolutely, antidepressants can be used. And People are under the impression um, that if you're started on an antidepressant, it's something you need to be on for life, but that's not necessarily true. Um, in conjunction with good assessment, good follow-up with physicians, some people may only be on an antidepressant for a year, um, or some people may be on it for longer. And, and just in the case of um, antipsychotics, absolutely. So for people who are hearing voices, seeing things that aren't there, hallucinating, uh, we use a class of medications called antipsychotics, and they're typically, ideally, short-term medications. I used to like them. I used to need them to drive home. I was mm -hmm. so I was so in such psychosis and paranoia mm -hmm. that I couldn't leave wherever I was. So when I was using methamphetamine, I would take a antipsychotic just to make it to my next destination. Okay. In quick, in quick use. So you knew what you were doing. I I was a great doctor back then. <laughs> so we have some questions. There was a. Um, one question was, what's the difference between the substance use disorder as per the DSM and the 12 step programs definition of addiction or alcoholism? Well, um, that's a loaded question. It's a loaded question, but you know, one of the adages of the, the 12 step philosophy is that uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different response, yeah. right? And when we look at the DSM's definition of addiction, we see that one of the hallmarks is people continue doing um, problematic things that are harmful to them. That are harmful to them, yeah. and so in a way, um, there's there's actually a similarity between what the the twelve step philosophy is saying and what the DSM is saying. So the twelve step philosophy, as we know, says there's two things that are going on. Mm -hmm. There's an obsession of the mind. Mm -hmm. There's this thought that I need to use right now. I mm -hmm. gotta 
I got to get some of that in my system. And then there's the craving. Right. Once we put something in our system, we can't stop taking it or we want more. Yeah. And we can't regulate the amount. So is that similar to what the DSM is saying, I think? Yeah, if, if we want to kind of science that. Because there's a bunch <laughs> of different points in the DSM, mm -hmm. like probably for addiction, like alcoholism, probably 10 or 11 points. For sure. Because it defines severe, moderate, and extreme, right? But in the same respect as what the 12-step philosophy is saying, there is a, a preoccupation, right, or an, an obsession, a rumination, um, spending lots of time during the day on finding a dealer, getting the money we need to get what we want, et cetera. And then there's the, the physiological craving. Right. So even that idealization, and I've heard it many times, there are alcoholics that only drink on the weekend. Right. But all day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, mm -hmm. all they're thinking about is Friday night. Right. And, and so what we see, um, and I know you and I have had these discussions before, is it's not necessarily just about the drinking. If you think of uh, taking a pebble and dropping it in the middle of a pond, and the ripples that come out, what we see in addiction is that it's sort of 90% to do with the life activity, thinking, everything else going on, and then the, the drinking or the use is, is a kind symptom. of... Yeah. Symptom of the problem. Absolutely. So how long after regular drug... Another question came in asking, how long after regular drug use, whether it be opioids, alcohol, or pot, could mental health still be an issue? And I guess that is very independent of the per very dependent on the person we're talking about. It, it's individualized for sure, but um, you know, in my opinion, I would say that if a mental health issue has arisen purely as the result uh, of a drug use, then you know, typically within a month or six weeks, we'll know. Okay. Um, and of course, depends what we're talking about when we say mental health issue. If we're talking a psychosis. That should be over fairly quickly. If we're talking depression, um, somebody, for example, who's addicted to cocaine could find themselves depressed for weeks after they stop using. Right. And we know why. Because of the serotonin uptake inhibitors yeah. and the fact of how the brain works. Exactly. I, I, found, I found sometimes it takes up to two years mm -hmm. to really get the synapses working again. Right. And uh, it, it, it's, it's essential that we sit down with someone and get that history so we know how to treat them properly. It is. The same person asked, um, would, the very, would very casual use trigger a mental breakdown or withdrawal? You know, and it depends again on the substance. It depends on the substance. It depends on the individual. So when we speak about um, the likelihood that somebody is going to have a mental illness or experience a symptom of, of a mental illness, we talk about susceptibility and everyone sort of has these different susceptibility levels. Some people might be quite hardy or strong against uh, having a mental illness, whereas some people might not have many defenses. So you could have a young person who tries marijuana and ends up with a psychotic episode, whereas you could have another individual who tries it and doesn't have a psychotic <clears throat> episode. The same marijuana. Same marijuana, yeah. So it depends on our individual susceptibility. All right. How long um, do you need to be sober before you can be diagnosed really with a mental health issue? And I guess, I guess it again depends on the substance. Same thing. It's the substance. It's the individual. But if symptoms were lingering for a period of weeks, it would give us a better picture. Okay. So you, you really watch people really closely mm -hmm. at Aurora. They watch people really closely in that first 14 to 21 day period to yeah. see, to see what's going on a, a mental mentally with each of them. Exactly. And um, I guess I guess we didn't touch on the fact that uh, I supervised the medical detox there. And I think one of the big differences um, that you might find at Aurora, um, if we're comparing with, with other centers, is that we have uh, registered psychiatric nurses. And um, not only do we find registered psychiatric nurses to be prepared with the type of education needed to respond to uh, people uh, calmly, kindly, compassionately. They're also mental health specialists. So we get a good feel over time. Um, one of our, one of our uh, watcher viewers just asked, how does symptoms of post-acute withdrawal syndrome relate to mental health symptoms? You know, um, when it comes to mental health issues, uh, we can be describing the same thing in different words or in different language okay. in, in mental health and in AA for example. So uh, post-acute withdrawal, for those who aren't familiar, is a term um, in AA that kind of refers to 
the early days of being in withdrawal. And I would say they're kind of uh, two sides of the same coin. Right. What about, um, oh, another, another viewer just asked a question. Can marijuana cause psychosis? Also, have you heard of bath salts being used? And what does that look like if someone is actually using them? Absolutely. So um, yes, marijuana can cause psychosis. Uh, there is a lot of scientific evidence on this. And additionally, um, I have worked with a number of psychiatrists who on the ground in the emergency rooms talk about people coming in and, and these people have only used weed. Is that because weed is so much more potent today or is it because it's laced with things? I think it could be both. I think that as time has gone by and people have gotten clever, they've found ways of increasing uh, the THC levels and cannabinoids. And so um, the chemicals are much stronger. But absolutely, it's also laced. Marijuana can be laced with fentanyl. It can be laced with cocaine. It can be laced with crack. Amphetamine. Amphetamines. So uh, you were talking about the THC and, and the cannabis. Right. So um, the, there are different strengths. Is it those that cause the psychosis? Uh, again, whether we're going to have a psychosis or have a mental health issue is based on our susceptibility. And uh, science isn't quite there yet to know why that happens. Uh, in terms of bath salts, uh, so bath salts would be an example of uh, kind of an atypical substance, you know, using chemicals basically to get high. And um, it, it sends people into a type of psychosis. The best example that comes to my mind, we're just hearing it on the news, but you know, you remember a couple of years ago, there was a, a story about a young guy having these bath salts and kind of um, being very violent towards people in the States. Well, what, are, what are bath salts? Uh, I believe that bath salts are literally bath salts. Um, so people are looking for, and I think this tells us something about society, people are, are looking for new and creative ways of getting high using anything. Do you know what the high is like on bath salts? Have you ever heard? I haven't had the pleasure of working with people who have used bath salts. All right. um, we have another question. If an alcoholic is diagnosed with depression and put on meds, um, for instance, this was citro, citro, citrolopram, citalopram? citalopram, but continues to drink, what bad happens? Or, yeah, you know, I've often talked about how antidepressants don't really work if you're drinking because alcohol is a depressant. Right. Um, so, Alcohol and antidepressants are a dangerous combination. Um, many of the antidepressants we use today are called um, serotonin inhibitors. And what the alcohol does is kind of amplify the serotonin and makes it go um, kind of wild. And uh, people can end up feeling quite suicidal if they're drinking and using antidepressants. Um, so not a good combination. A good combo, eh? Um, we have a question. Any comment on the use of sleeping pills, anxiety meds, adding anxiety meds into the mix? Sleeping pills and anxiety meds. Um, well, we know for sure there are some non-addictive sleeping pills, mm -hmm. but we know for sure that most anti-anxiety meds, benzos, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are highly, highly addictive. Right. And the reason why anti-anxiety medication is addictive is because it has what we call a short half-life. So the half-life refers to how long a medication will last in your system. And basically the idea goes that if it doesn't last long, you're going to want it again sooner. So when it comes to anxiety, which is an emotion, a feeling that kind of goes through peaks and valleys, if we are cutting down those peaks and valleys, but those, those cut downs come sooner and sooner, what we find is we need more medication and we need it more frequently in order to feel calm. So um, I would say that anti-anxiety medication should be short term and we should be coupling it with other strategies. Okay. Um, another question, not being aware of bipolar when you're, when our son was young, now he's 40. I now feel he may be bipolar and he's either really up with grand ideas or he's really low. When he, was, when he was little, I used to feel he was like a Jekyll and Hyde. We know that most people that become addicted mm -hmm. or are addicted or have Jekyll and Hyde personalities from a very young age all the time. Right. Um, he, he always felt we knocked down his big ideas, which I guess we did. But 
the truth is, is um, I guess it's it's really a statement. But what do you make of the statement? Yeah, I I, I think kind of um, the the person with this question is getting at you know did the drugs make these these things better or worse? Right, right. right. And um, so what we find with drugs and alcohol is that the symptoms often mimic what we would see with mental illness. So um, not knowing what this particular person was using, um, you know, if it was something like cocaine or a stimulant that makes people feel invincible and high and strong, that's going to look like mania, you know? And so the question is, is when the cocaine is put to the side and the person is sober for some time, are they still feeling like they're manic? Okay. And that would sort of tell us whether or not um, it's, a, it's a mental illness. Um, I was thinking today that most people, when they get clean and sober, end up on the pink cloud. Have you ever heard of the pink cloud? Rose-colored glasses. Rose-colored glasses. Everything's right. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and so do we often see that once that rose-colored glasses feeling is over, that yeah. people fall into depressions or anxiety? It can happen. Um, I think one of the things that's common in addiction in particular is that when people are detoxing, when people are feeling unwell, they come in, they start to feel well, and then with that, within about a week, they're fixed. They're good to go. I can go out and I can be safe. Um, what we find then is that if people remain in treatment, they'll do well, they're happy, they enjoy the, so the social setting, they're having a good time, but then reality starts to kick in. What is it going to be like to be sober forever? Um, what does it mean not to be able to go out on the weekend, etc.? And then absolutely people start to crash and people start to feel depressed. So we would call that probably more of a situational depression than a, um, than a true depression. So is that treated with meds? You know, not as a first approach. Um, not as a first approach. Talk therapy? Talk therapy, you know, strategies such as learning uh, appreciation, gratitude, meditation, mindfulness, yeah. taking up a new meaning and purpose. So, you know, if I can't go out every weekend and I can't have the same circle of friends, what can I put myself into? That's right. Once again, we're, we're about halfway through our webinar on mental health and addictions tonight. And I just want to remind you to please submit your questions uh, for John to answer. We're doing the best we can to get to them all. And we would, uh, we would definitely like to get some more. So please, if you're watching, please take the time now to submit some more questions and we'll be glad to answer them for you. And we'll go to the next question. Mm -hmm. What is the common co-occurring disorder related to addiction? Is it PTSD? If so, does trauma relate to it? So what are the types of mental illnesses that we see most commonly in addiction? Um, I would say that PTSD would be one of those. I would say that anxiety is one, and I would say that depression is another. And I would say that um, different types of psychotic disorders would be another one. So PTSD essentially is when our body, our brain, has had such a distressing experience or we've somehow been subject to such a distressing experience. Maybe our, our spouse has been attacked. And so even though it's something that didn't happen to us, it happened to someone who's close enough to us, we feel traumatized. And our brain has a delayed and ongoing reaction to that. So it's going to show up in certain symptoms, right? I'm going to be easily scared. Perhaps I'll have nightmares. Perhaps I won't trust people. Perhaps I'll kind of disassociate and go into sort of um, like a daydream state. So what we're going to do is to want to treat those symptoms, right? And so Short term. We, short term. And so if we think of um, addiction and we think of PTSD, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to drink or I'm going to smoke marijuana or I'm going to do other things that make those symptoms go away. So, you know, are children of addicts and individuals living with mental health issues more likely to experience addiction? Yeah. So, you know, I think both from research and from practice, our day to day experience as clinicians, we can see that people who grow up in um, addicted households, people who grow up with parents who have addiction um, are more likely to be exposed to those things. There's also questions of um, socioeconomic issues and, you know, addiction can be correlated to socioeconomic issues. If I'm growing up in a household where I don't have my basic needs met, you know, am I going to, um, to, to grow up looking for other things? All right. Yeah. Another question. Do you think doctors or health professionals are wrongly 
or loosely prescribing medication to treat mental health issues. We talked about that a little bit earlier about how they, they just want to help. We spoke Someone to- comes in, they're talking about their feelings for 30 minutes or 15 minutes or however long they see the doctor. Mm-hmm. And the doctor makes a diagnosis and gives them a medication. I think it's a complicated issue. I think that um, physicians in our society have been expected to treat people and to give answers for things. Okay. And I see the other side of the coin where people are coming in and, you know, maybe they haven't had the resources or the hindsight to do things like try physiotherapy first or try massage first or try to tolerate pain, etc. They're desperate. <coughs> They're looking for a solution. The solution is a pill. So I think it's a complicated issue. Um, if you want to look at, um, you know, uh, different organizations who have tracked amounts of prescription medications that have been prescribed by physicians, etc. They may say that, yes, there has been overprescribing. I think it's complicated. So here the question was wrongly or loosely. So wrongly, you kind of dis- discussed. Mm. Maybe they don't have enough information to really prescribe what they're prescribing. Right. They've done a minor, short kind of inventory of the, of, of the, the patient and ultimately decide to prescribe something based on that. Yeah. Um, but loose, loosely, loosely, what it said, you know, she said wrongly or loosely prescribing medication. Yeah. Do we think it's, we hear on the news all the time about how deadly some of this stuff is. Do you think it's, it's prescribed as loosely as, as uh, they say it is? Well, I think it takes two to tango. And I think that, um, well, we know that a major component of addiction yep. is behaviors like doctor shopping. Yeah. Prescription shopping. Yeah. I've run out of pills a week early. I'm going to go back. So um, in addition to looking at what the physician is doing, we need to be looking at what the patient is doing. And, you know, um, are we doing that? I don't think so. I don't think so. So there's, there should be a registry of some kind for doctors to see if someone's come there the week before from for lorazepam or codeine or some kind of painkiller. You know, and in a in a system like health, which is so expensive and has all sorts of constraints, um, I think that something like that would be possible, but challenging. All right. Are, um, do we, do we talk about children of addicts and alcohol? Yeah. Are children of addicts and alcoholics living with mental health issues more likely to experience addiction? Children of addicts and individuals living with mental health more likely to experience addiction. Um, I think that, you know, there are genetic links okay. and connections between, you know, a parent having a mental illness and a child having the mental illness as well. I also think that family coping yeah. is a big deal. So um, if myself, uh, hypothetically, as an as a adult child of, of someone with alcoholism, how did we cope and how did we interact as a family? And as I grow into an adult, how do I choose to cope and interact? Makes sense. You know, and if I'm coping poorly, poor coping might become a mental, mental health issue. Are we, are we turning to pills too often and too quickly? Like without looking at into the root issues or trying to do some form of treatment first or mental health treatment? Absolutely. Um, I keep plugging my profession, which is registered psychiatric nursing. But what I would say about psychiatric nursing is that our emphasis is on helping people to find solutions that um, are holistic and not necessarily medicinal. So like you said before, it's talk therapy, it's group therapy, it's family therapy. and, you know, not to say that medication doesn't have a place, but it needs to be um, second rather than first. It makes sense. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Once again, um, as we're moving along here, we're getting lots of great questions from you guys. And uh, please feel free to ask John more questions. Or if you have a question for me about Aurora or about my life, I'm very willing to help answer them as well. Uh, maybe what we can do as well is to uh, look at the slides. Go back to the slideshow. Yeah, and maybe just talk a little bit about, so what do we do? Okay. You know, if we find that we are experiencing a dual diagnosis, mental health and addiction, what do we do? So let's um, look at this question before we move on to that. Coming up. Yeah. Uh, the question? Okay, so uh, we have someone ask the question here. They've noticed their addictive behavior increases when they're stressed. Okay. Can't change the situation immediately. How can I address my mental health to keep the addictive behavior at bay? 
So um, one of the things we know about mental illness is that it does go hand in hand with stress. And uh, let's take, for example, anxiety um, or another disorder that has things in common with anxiety, which is OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. What we see is that as people's stress levels rise, so does their symptomology. Um, so what I would suggest for this person is um, finding some good, reputable information about mindfulness online. So mindfulness is, an, in a nutshell, is learning how to sit and be present and tolerate what's happening for us in the moment. Great. And allowing emotions like anxiety to dissipate. That would be one solution. What's another solution? What's another solution? Uh, another solution would be distraction. Okay. Right? So exercise, going for a walk. Maybe I can't change what's immediately happening around me, but I could take myself out of it for several minutes. Um, what about, um, actually, we're going back to the slides. Do you want yeah. To for sure. So um, what do we do, right? And uh, what I like about this slide that we have here, if we can get it back up, is that um, it talks about hope. Yeah. And uh, hope is, I, I went to the movies the other day, I, I think it was uh, the, the new superhero movies. Um, what am I thinking of here with Superman, Batman, they're all together. Okay. Justice League. Justice, Justice League. League. There we go. I went to see Justice League the other day, and uh, Superman, Clark Kent, said something about hope. And he said that hope is kind of like your car keys. It can be easy to lose. If you dig around for a little bit, you tend to find them. So hope is something that's very important for us to have um, as people with mental health or addiction issues. And I think it's impossible to know that it's, it's important to know that Things can change positively and often do change positively. So when it comes to treatment for these conditions, the most effective way of treating co-occurring addiction and mental health issues is to treat both at the same time. So mental health concerns are often treated symptomatically and symptoms we might suspect to be mental health related will dissipate with the passage of time. Okay. Um, specialist involvement is important registered psychiatric nurses, registered nurses, nurse practitioners, psychiatrists. Um, and these are all services that we offer at Aurora Recovery Center. Often I hear um, parents talking about their kids to me mm -hmm. and they talk about they are sure there's an underlying, underlying mental health issue. They're sure of it. Can you check them? The minute he gets there, he's only there for four weeks. The minute he gets there, can you please make sure the member goes to get a psychiatric evaluation? Right. What do you What do you say about that into those parents? Well, again, our nursing staff is trained to identify mental health symptoms pretty quickly. As you know, we have a fairly thorough system of you as an interventionist and other interventionists doing an assessment on people before they come in. So before people come into our facility, we hit the ground running with a lot of information. Uh, and then what actually happens is we um, get to know them in the first few days. And, uh, you know, as long as the, the child or the loved one gives us consent, we're in a position to be able to um, speak to the family members and kind of see what they're seeing. So we're getting information before the person comes in. We're getting information when the person is on the ground. And we're get, gathering information from other sources like family members. Well, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, if I have an ex who's an addict, I have an, if an ex of, a, of an addict won't let their children visit or talk to the dad while in treatment, is that a bad or a good thing? You know, um, families and boundaries involved with families are a huge issue. Um, and what we, uh, also have at Aurora, are marriage and family therapists. Yeah. And marriage and family therapists are specialists in dealing with the family unit. And whenever we identify a situation um, that we think involves um, the involvement of a, of a MMFT, then we do it. Okay. So we have a, we have a question from a couple of parents here. Do you feel that addiction sometimes is used to fill the void of not having quick access to mental health in our province? 
and as well as doctors trying to be helpful by providing meds to fill that void as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, waiting lists and um, issues of service access are huge across Canada. Um, you know, if you want to, uh, for example, have an appointment with a community mental health centre across the province, you're typically going to have to wait for weeks, if not months. If you want to see a psychiatrist, you're typically going to have to wait for weeks, if not, not months, unless it's an emergency. Yeah. So you've got all these people waiting and because they can't deal with their symptoms, absolutely, they're going to turn to addiction. Yesterday, I was told that uh, the wait time of the provincial system for a, ma a man to get a bed in treatment for an assessment is three months, three, point, three months in a week. Right. And if we if we want to think from a, um, a prophylactic, uh, you know, uh, strong healthcare perspective, what happens to that person in those three months? Does their addiction get better or worse? I'm going to get I'm going to guess it gets worse. Um, and what we know about Aurora is that we're open 24 seven and we'll take uh, people 24 seven with no wait times. 365 days a year, I might add. Right. Yeah, so it's really important. I've always been a proponent of the minute someone's requesting help, there has to be help available. Absolutely. The minute. Well, you have a very, and we can talk about this a bit, yeah. you have a very short window. Right. Tiny little window to get someone to say, yes, I'll go to treatment. Absolutely. They have to be in pain. Yeah. They have to be near a bottom. Yeah. They have to be as uncomfortable as possible. Yeah. What else? Well, let's pile a mental mental health problem on top of that, right? So if it's been hard enough for the person to access a service because they're guilty, they're ashamed, they're drunk, they're high, let's throw a mental illness on top of that where they might have impaired judgment, they might not think very straight. So whenever we see a pinpoint of light where someone indicates that they want help, we need to be able to act on that very quickly. That's very interesting. Yeah. I've always believed that, but... But, yeah. but I, it's very interesting. Uh, we have another question um, from two parents. When members of Aurora are getting ready to leave Aurora or leave the program, and it has not yet been determined if they have mental illness or anxiety or depression due to the addiction, do you suggest or know of a practitioner who really understands addiction and mental health, as we have found it to be very difficult to find the right help in the community? Right. So um, for our listeners who might not be familiar, uh, Aurora Recovery Center actually has outpatient services here in Winnipeg, which is where you and I are right now filming tonight, uh, 39 Schofield. Um, so uh, I believe that the therapists and counselors who work out of this location have the skills to be able to help people determine that. Um, if you want to talk about uh, general resources available in the community, things like community mental health, um, Canadian Mental Health Association here in Winnipeg, for example, would be other mm -hmm. places people could go to. That's good. Yeah. Um, so check in with Aurora on Skirfield at our outpatient clinic. And if they can't help you, I'm sure they have a, a well, I know they have a resource book of people they might be able to send it to. Absolutely. So that would be the best way to answer that question. Um, are you finding co-occurring disorders becoming way more the norm? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, in the past, for example, when it came to addiction, we would find that many people would be straight um, abusers of alcohol, right? Whereas today, it's it's very uncommon to find someone who strictly uh, is addicted to alcohol. It'll be alcohol, it'll be pills, etc. I think probably the same is true when it comes to co-occurring disorders. Perhaps in the past, we had people who who um, only had the one and not the other, but I think today more people than not have a co-occurring disorder with addiction. With addiction, so an addiction and a mental health problem in the, in the same hand. Interesting. Yeah. So we're getting to uh, the well, the last ten minutes of this segment of of um, our webinar from Aurora Recovery Center. I hope it's been helpful for you, and I hope you're enjoying listening uh, to our our. our um, Specialist tonight, John, who's a psychiatric nurse, and um, we really appreciate you watching. Please, we have about 10 more minutes left, and we can uh, field a few more questions. So uh, please send your questions in as we continue. Do we Absolutely. Do we find, um, um, often we find an addiction uh, that cutting and eating disorders mm -hmm. 
and other process addictions are becoming more the norm. Right. We're often seeing, especially with uh, the younger younger women mm -hmm. that come into treatment, that come in even with it, with any substance abuse, be it opiate, methamphetamine, cocaine, crack, alcohol, that often they have the co-occurring disorder or the other real me the other really non-mental health issue mm -hmm. is anorexia or bulimia mm -hmm. or cutting. Mm -hmm. And and I've always been taught they're very similar to addiction. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. uh, the same kind of thing. Right. We, know we know they need to be treated a little differently, mm -hmm. but it's the same thing. Can you tell us about, especially, well, women and men that come in to um, treatment these days with an eating disorder and an addiction? Right. Um, let's touch on the issue of cutting or self-harm briefly first. And um, cutting or self-harm and addiction put together make a lot of sense. So individuals who cut, quite commonly, um, a, a diagnosis for them might be what we call a personality disorder, and particularly um, a borderline personality disorder. And one of the hallmarks of people who have borderline personality disorder is the inability to handle and process emotion. So if I'm feeling very down and very dark about something, I'm going to find relief perhaps by cutting myself. Now, when I cut myself, the body does all sorts of interesting things. It releases all sorts of chemicals, pain endorphins and different things. And I get a feeling out of that. So, so that's how it's similar to addiction. It sounds very similar to addiction, right? right? And it's the same thing when it comes to eating disorders. For example, if we want to talk about eating and purging, okay? So if I'm somebody who binges on food and then I make myself vomit, I get a feeling from that, right? Both a physical feeling and a rush of certain brain chemicals. And so it's actually very common for people to cycle through behaviors such as self-harm, eating and purging, and addiction. Interesting. And as we kind At the of, same time or one after the other? Over time. So it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. Right at the game at the fair or the game at the yeah, arcade, yeah. one mole pops up, the eating disorder, we get that under wraps, and then perhaps we find the um, alcohol addiction becomes more prevalent. Yeah, interesting. Get that under wraps, and then we we find maybe things like cutting and self harm. We have a, 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 someone asked, can you just go to the Aurora outpatient program instead of the recovery center? And I think it's really important to understand we do at, at our outpatient clinic, we do have many programs for both the addicted. Uh, opiate replacement therapy, uh, addicted people, as well as families. And those programs are really intense and they're really good. Um, there's no, there's nothing like intensive inpatient uh, treatment or recovery. There's uh, something about separating someone from their environment for a period of time, getting them off the drugs and alcohol. But lots of people can't spend the month or two really in a, in a kind of a lockdown situation where they're in a recovery center. So it's, a, it's another alternative to, you know, I call it coming to terms yeah. with, with really, you know, coming to terms with your addiction. And if you can be successful there, great. And then if not, we have indicators where I was not successful at outpatient. It was, it's really important for me uh, to go into an inpatient environment. Right. Or in, in member environment, as we call it. At right. Aurora Recovery Center, we don't have patients, we have members. Right. And um, I guess the reason why we use the term members is because we're trying to build a community. And when people are finished at Aurora, and I feel that this kind of ties into our conversation, um, they're not just done with us. They become members of a larger community where we're always able to offer them help. So what I would say, um, just to piggyback on, on what you were saying, is they might come to the outpatient services, and um, after a few sessions, they might discover that they want to do it. They want to come and, and stay with us in, in Gimli. Um, so, you know... Give it a, whatever works for people, they should give it a try and see where it goes. The most important thing is just starting, right? Seeking help in the first Seeking place. The, step one. Yeah. Seek, seek the help for the problem. Exactly. Um, are there mental health disorders that could be cured without drugs? Mental health disorders that could be cured without drugs. Many people um, choose not to use medication for their mental health issues. It's actually quite common. And I think it really depends on the context. It really depends on the individual. Um, when it comes to psychosis, which is things like having very um, strange fixed beliefs, seeing things that aren't there, hearing things that aren't there, what we say is those things should be treated as quickly and as well as possible because otherwise the prognosis becomes worse. 
Um, but many people choose to deal with, for example, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder without the use of medication. All right. Well, we're getting to the end of our segment. We have about five minutes left. Uh, we have no questions left. So if you do have a question, um, please send it in really quickly. Just a reminder that tomorrow night we're going to be meeting again at 7 p.m. Uh, for the fourth webinar. And we're going to be doing that webinar on methamphetamine and opiates and opioids. So it should be a lively discussion since we know that we have a crisis right now in Manitoba with both. So we're going to have a lively discussion tomorrow night. Please um, uh, send the link to your friends. Tell your friends to join us tomorrow night. Uh, you just can go to AuroraRecoveryCenter.com, as you know, and register. Please send a message out um, to anybody you think that might be helpful for that are either struggling with a methamphetamine addiction or an opiate addiction or family members that have loved ones um, suffering from those addictions. So, John, I want to take the time to thank you tonight. Thank you for spending an hour with me. It's my pleasure. It's been, uh, it's been very helpful. I've, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure that uh, the people that are um, viewing our webinar tonight have learned a lot. And hopefully um, we've shaded, shed some light on the topic of mental health and addictions. And again, join in tomorrow night for uh, Aurora Recovery Seminar webinar number four. Thanks very much. Thank you.